do believe that God does have a powerful word for all of us in this place. If you're here, you're not here by any mistake. God has you here uh, for a purpose and a reason, and I believe that he's going to touch our hearts through these words. All right. Um, as we begin our this um, sermon, let's just open with a word of prayer. God, once again, we come before you. We are thanking you for gathering us here today, and God, we pray that you would bless your word. God, it's all about you and your word. Without your word, without your, your spirit, these are just words on a paper. But God, I just thank you that your spirit brings life. So I pray that you would breathe into us. God, I pray for the hearts and the minds who are going to receive this, that it will fall on good ground, God. And that you would open our eyes and our hearts to the ways that you have us to walk in. Lord, just be present in this place and let your word come alive to us. And God, I pray that you would just um, bless every heart that's here. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for the musical prayer music. All right. We are talking today, that the subject that we're going to talk about today is the invisible black woman. That's what we're talking about today, the invisible black woman. Um, we are entering, as our pastors so eloquently stated, that we are entering a time of uh, intentional discussion, a very intentional discussion, and it is on our uh, Sawabona series. Uh, I don't, if you can see this, um, if you were here before Pastor Ben came and just did an awesome word and really deposited this word into our, our church. Um, so this is where Salwabona came from. If you're sitting here like, what the heck is Salwabona? What are they talking about, right? Um, this is a, a, it's a Zulu greeting, meaning I see you. So if you approach someone, you would say Salwabona, saying I see you. And their response back to you on this side, it would be, because you see me, I am here. That would be their response to you. In the sense that until you saw me, I didn't exist. By recognize me, you, recognizing me, you brought me into existence. Isn't that powerful? Even to greet one another that way, I see you. And because, because you see me, before you saw me, I didn't exist, but now I, I, I'm here because you see me. Powerful greeting. So this is why we're doing this called a Salwabona series, because we want um, people to know that we see them. Today we're talking about the invisible black woman who often goes unseen and unheard. So we are the body of Christ. Everybody knows that? We are the body. No, we, if you look at your body, everything's not, we're not all legs, we're not all toes, we're not all ears. Different parts make up our body, and they all have very different functions, and they're all very needed. You know, your baby pinky toe might not be as important as your brain, you know, perhaps, but go ahead and stub that pinky toe. See how your body gonna react right? So we are the body of Christ. So if one element, if one member of the body is hurting, then all of us as a body should react to that member and lend comfort. Amen? This is what we're talking about today. If we are the body of Christ and we have one person, one member that is hurting, it's, all, it's our duty to react. And we have a group in the body of Christ who is all, often the backbone of the church. But we have been repeatedly told to keep a stiff upper lip. Come on, suck it up. You know, hold this, hold it, hold this, hold that, hold this, hold that, hold this, hold that. Why? Because you're strong. That's what black women do, right? That's the characteristic if, if we were to get, have people come up to and describe what, in your opinion, what is a, the characteristic of a black woman? But without even thinking, 99% of us would be like, oh, strong. Strong black woman, strong, right? Um, you know, as black women, oftentimes you're not allowed to bleed, to show weakness, have a complaint, be frustrated, because, well, then you'll just be another angry black woman, right? We, we've never really had the luxury of being a damsel in distress. I know I have feminists in here. I'm not advocating a damsel in distress. But 
Have you, when you think of dance when you're in distress, you know, like, oh, my gosh, I don't know what to do. Carry on. You know, if anyone who is a person of color were to act that way around you, be like, girl, you better come on. You got stuff to do. We don't, get yourself together and go. Come on. We don't get that luxury of, oh, my gosh, what shall I do, right? <laughs> America seems like they're more comfortable with the kind of Aunt Jemima kind of persona of a black woman, right? Always caring and kind and, you know, forget about her feelings. She has kids at home, but that's okay. Take care of our kids. You know, never, she's never showing, you know, her emotions. She's just caring for everyone else and often neglects herself. So if you're a black woman here, are you the go-to person you, you're, you're labeled often as the go-to person, but who's going to you? Who sees you? Who hears you? Do you often feel invisible? As we journey into this series, if you're not a black woman, we are asking that you please do not check out. Please don't check out. If you're not a black woman sitting in this congregation right now or on our Facebook Live page, please do not check out. We want our congregation to develop a Philippians 2 mindset. And this is the book that we're talking about. I forgot to tell you that. Philippians 2 is a beautiful passage. And this is the mindset that we would love for our church to develop. It says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete. Why? How? By being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Isn't that a powerful statement? We want to develop a Philippians 2 attitude, where when, when, one's, when one is hurt, we're all hurt. If you're struggling, then we all struggling. Um, so are you guys ready? Can we dive in together? You guys good? Everybody's with us? Don't check me out. Don't start thinking about dinner. Don't start thinking about how you're going to get home and rain. Stay with me. All right. Today we are going to talk about, oh, oh before I get to that, I'm asking everyone, I'm so excited to, to, to say this, that um, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I, I want everyone in this congregation and on Facebook Live to lean in with us. All right? Lean in. Take a walk in our shoes. Listen. Find out what it's like to be in our skin without an all lives matter mentality. I might get in trouble. So if you're non-black, come on and lean in with us. We want you today just to take a walk in our shoes. We want, we, we, we're, we want you to veer away from all lives matter because, of course, all of us know that all lives matter. But if all lives mattered, we wouldn't have to say black lives mattered, right? If that, if that was a true statement, we wouldn't have to bring awareness to our cause. So on this day, black women matter. And I don't want you to shut, up, shut us off. I want you to walk with us, all right? All right, we're diving in. You ready? All right, today we are going to talk about not one, but two black women in the Bible, Surprising, right? Because the little picture books didn't say there were black people in my little Bible, my little picture books. Some of you might be surprised that we in there. But we in there, all right? So I want you to take this time to sit with our burden, all right? We family in here today, right? All right, I want you to take the time, if you're not a black woman, to sit with our burden, Okay, our first passage we're going to go to is Numbers. Numbers 12, an often unread verse. 
But you will be very surprised at what you find in Numbers 12. All right? I'm going to go ahead. If you get a Bible, just go ahead and look in your glossary. Catch up with us. I guess I'm, I'm on one side today. Yeah. Numbers 12. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. Why? Because of the Cushite woman whom he had married. For he had married a Cushite woman. All right, I'm going to just stop right there. Give you some background information. Miriam and Aaron are Moses' brother and sister. You remember Miriam because she was the one who helped hide her brother when, the Fer- when Pharaoh told everybody, we're killing all the kids. She was a little precious soul that went and put her, her uh, baby brother in the river where there, and he was then found by Pharaoh and raised by his daughter. That was Sister Miriam. Also, Aaron is Moses' brother. All right? He was the one when Moses, God called Moses, I need you to go. Go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses like, look, check it out. I stutter. I don't speak well. Hey, here's my brother. Take him. That brother was Aaron. So uh, within the, the, the Israelite culture, they were pretty high ranking. Miriam even had a little prophecy. She had a little tambourine. If y'all read it, it's in there. Come on, Deke. She did a little tambourine dance. Aaron became the high priest for the nation. So they were pretty high ranking. All right. And in verse two, they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And very important, it says, and the Lord what? Heard it. Very interesting. This passage is very short, but it's very interesting. How many people have ever seen this? You would just fly right by it. I can't even remember. Like, my favorite passage is Numbers. No, right? You would just fly right by this. Very interesting that um, they were upset with Moses because he had married a Cushite woman. A Cushite woman was a black woman from the land of Cush. So my first thought was, I see you, Moses. Okay, I see you, uh, Moses, my boy, I see you, Moses, better get you a Kushite. The same Moses that parted the Red Sea, plagues, all these wonderful things, got him a sister, Moses. So, his re- so there was there was a um, a underlying there's an underlying burden though that we need to explore here. We need to explore. There are some burdens that Moses' wife carried that black women are still carrying today. One of them is the burden of being judged and stereotyped by our skin and not our character, usually on sight. Now, sit sit with that for a minute. I'm going to be asking you a few times just to sit with that. Sit with what it feels like for your skin or your ethnicity to always be a problem. Sit with that. No matter what space you walk in, what classroom you go to, what job interview you attend, on first sight, usually... Just your skin. A lot of people get a chance to get to know people, to get to talk first and kind of judge somebody by their conversation. We don't always get that luxury. As soon as we walk in the building, automatically our skin is a problem. The first thing people see is not a person but a color. Can you sit with that with us? Rarely are we celebrated for our skin. Rarely. Rarely. But the tanning industry is making millions, on a side note. Everybody loves our skin, but nobody want to be black. I go to the beach, and I'm like, y'all, y'all just laying out? But y'all don't like us. What you out here doing? Getting dark. 
think about it. But don't like our skin. The next thing I, I see from this, a burden that we usually have to carry, is the burden of perceived social inferiority. Perceived. Perceived being inferior socially. You know, as black women, we can't even read the Bible without having to constantly revisit this issue. Think about it. This book is an ancient manuscript written thousands of years ago. But when we open it to Numbers 12, we see exactly what we're still dealing with in this present day. Sit with that. If you're not a black woman, what, how do you feel? How would you feel like a lot of people have histories and their countries are beautiful and they're celebrated in their country and you have history of greatness. But then when we look in the Bible, we still see the same thing that we're going through. What would that feel like? Right? Still, a, And then there's another burden I see here. The burden of constant, instant negative opinions and microaggressions. See, the real issue was that they were jealous of Moses and his position. But they used microaggression against his wife to mask it. It wasn't even a real issue. They were mad at Moses because they was like, he ain't all that. God talked to us too. That's why you married a black girl. I don't even like Moses, right? Constant microaggressions that didn't really even have to do with the, the situation. But these are things that we say, if you're, can you sit with that with us for a minute? This burden that we carry. If you were to go on with this passage, it's very interesting. You could read it on your own time. I don't want to take all of our time reading. Even though I, do, I love it. I'm like a Bible geek. I will have y'all sitting reading chapters. So you better thank God for the Holy Ghost. Because this is awesome, right? In verse 2, if you're, if you're in uh, Numbers 12, go ahead and read down. I cannot help but to say hi to the field parts and the new baby. I'm sorry. That is so unprofessional. But I just love y'all. Hi, guys. Yes. Okay, back to the word and important spiritual matters. Um, observation from the pastor. If you're in, in, in Numbers 12, go ahead and read down um, in verse 2. It says that the Lord heard it. It's still up here. The Lord heard it. You need to know that when injustice happens against you in any form or fashion, God hears it. Someone needs to take comfort in that fact. Because a lot of times we just be like, oh, well, it's another day. Being black, this is another day. But I want you to take comfort that God heard it. This is very, in your, when you think this is very micro, you know, in the light of we just left Egypt and we have, like, trying to get to the, to the promised land. But we got to change our thinking about God. He, he cares about little things. We think God only cares about the big things in our life. It specifically says God heard it. And if you go down to verse 6, if, you, if you're looking in your Bible or reading on your Bible app, I'm not going to put it up here. But in verse 6, God claps back. God claps back. In verse 6, he says, and he, God said, hear my words. Is there a prophet among you that I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision? I speak with him in a dream, but not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth clearly and not in riddles. He beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you afraid? Why were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? God didn't have any problem with Moses' personal choices. That's what I want y'all to see in that. God was like, if I have a prophet, there's never been a prophet like I speak to Moses face to face like I speak to a man. Moses didn't have, God didn't have a problem with Moses' personal choices and his selections for a wife. So why did people have a problem with it? God was like, I ain't tripping through your thing, Moses. Right? Also, I want you to note in verse 9, verse 9 said, and the, lang and the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. God was mad. Sit with that. 
God didn't like it. He didn't appreciate it. God was mad. So I want you to know in your life, if you're experiencing injustice, God's not sitting back in a rocking chair and saying, oh, well, deal with it. God was mad. He was mad about it, and he did something about it. Um, in verse 11, if you're still reading, check it out. Uh, Aaron, when God was, he, his, his anger burning against him, if you read the whole chapter, after they talked about Moses, he's like, hey, all three of y'all, come here. Everybody, come here. Stand up before me. God told them, you know, clap back at him. He removed himself. And when God removed himself, Miriam, the sister, became white with leprosy. She, she got leprosy all over. And that's when Aaron was like, oh, my Lord, do not punish us. For we have done foolishly and have sinned. Aaron admitted that they sinned. That he was wrong for being racist towards his wife. He was wrong. He was wrong for trying to usurp his position and authority and then masking it with racism. Right? And look at the poetic justice of God. I hope you're still in Numbers 12. Go ahead and read it for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Poetic justice is that since God was saying to Miriam, okay, since you have a problem with skin, I'm going to give you leprosy. <laughs> and guess what? Your skin going to turn all the way a whole nother color since you got such a problem with skin tone, Miriam. Right? She became leprous. And the thing about it, which was the ultimate experience, you know, whenever someone had leprosy back in that day, they had to be removed from the whole camp and had to live outside the camp. Outside the camp is where all the waste and the refuge and the, all the sick people and people with skin disease had to live. So Miriam had to experience what it was like to live marginalized and out, isolated outside the camp. Since she liked to talk about people, you go wait seven days outside the camp until I heal you. I tell you, a lot of times we don't think God sees these things. He sees Black woman, you're not invisible. God sees. So out of that story, I want you to sit with that. Sit with what that would feel like. All right? All right, we got one more woman to talk about. This one might be a little more familiar. I want you to go to Genesis 16. Genesis 16. Y'all still with me? Y'all all right? Nobody's checked out on me. We're going to get gooder and gooder. All right, family. The next woman we're going to talk about is in Genesis 16. Uh, was anyone in this room present when Pastor Donna was here on that Saturday um, where she came in? Oh, come on. Yeah, clap it up for Pastor Donna. <laughs> Pastor Donna is amazing. She tore this chapter up, and I can't even do it half the justice that she did, but I'll attempt to explain it a little bit the way she did. We're in Genesis 16. I want to give you a background story. This is a story about uh, Sarah and Hagar. Sarah was Abraham's wife. God had promised Abraham that I will bless you with kids. You, you can't even count how many kids you're going to have. It's going to be like the, the sand on the seashore. Moses, try to, I mean, Abraham, try to count the sand. I can't. Exactly. Your descent is going to be like the stars in the sky. Go ahead and count them. Well, I, I can't. Yes. I'm going to give you lots of kids. And so, you know, like, cool, kids, yeah. You know, another year goes by, 10 years go by, 50 years go by, 100 years go by, or almost 100, still no kids. They're like, well, I don't know what's up with the little prophecy that God sent, but obviously it's not happening. Maybe God meant that we had to use our little slave people and look, that was their, their common practice. If you can't have a baby, they would just have the slave. The slave will become a wife. And it was like, she's a surrogate. So they're like, okay, God's taking too long. We're just going to, Sarah's big idea. Go ahead. I'm going to give you Hagar. And you go ahead and have a baby with her. She'll be our kid. Same difference, right? But is that what God said to do? So the background with Hagar is that she was in an Egyptian slave. 
Where is Egypt? All right, because a lot of times when we read the little Bible passages, they be trying to make Egypt be a whole other continent or something. But Egypt's in Africa, therefore Hagar was. Oh, y'all smart. Y'all got a cow? Go bears. All right. Teaching y'all up there. So here we have an African slave. Once again, if you're in this room, I'm going to ask you to sit with something. I want you to hold something with us. Sit with us in the con- what it's like to continually have the image of seeing your people in the light of slavery. Even when you look in the Bible. Once again, we have an African young lady who is a slave. And a lot of us, you know, are, you know, I'm so down with Birth of the Nation. Yes, can't wait to see it. But a lot of our movies are usually, black films are about slavery. Again. Like, how many different ways can we dissect slavery? You know, sometimes we just want a movie about love, maybe going shopping, hanging out with your friends, a love story, a suspense thriller. Can we be in a, drama, a, a mystery movie? You know, can we get other genres of film? No, we're just going to do slave movies. All right. It's an important part of history. We need to see it. But, you know, sometimes sit with us and see what would it feel like to even open a Bible and consistently see your people being talked about in the light of slavery. Sit with it. Sit with us. All right. Our, our little baby Hagar also had some burdens that I want to share with you. All right. So we have Hagar. She was given to Abraham. Remember, Abraham's really old, and she's like a, a young girl. Uh, Hagar got in a little trouble. If you were in uh, Genesis 16, before we read this passage, um, in verse 4, if you're there in your own Bible, in your own Bible app, um, she can see. She was pregnant. And then when, uh, when she be- discovered that she was pregnant, she began to look with contempt at her mistress, right? She started, you know, she had a little attitude change toward her mistress. And this is another burden that black women have to deal with. The burden of being put into situations that we didn't ask for. This is a huge burden. Because, see, little, little, little Hagar didn't ask to sleep with him. She was told to do it. Can you imagine, you know, she's like a young lady, he's super old, she becomes pregnant, she got, she feels a little certain way about it. You know, you can, you can catch these mean mugs, Sarah. I didn't ask for this. She began to, you know, she, she wasn't allowed to have her feelings portrayed, right? The strong black woman is holding everything for everybody. But I want you to know it's not always because we're just so saint-like. It's usually out of necessity or survival. We're also often labeled, you know, you just, girl, you got it. You got everything. You know, a lot of us didn't ask to be put in these situations. Your baby daddy acting crazy. Your car is broken down. I got these these kids still got to get to school. I don't know. I got to pay this tuition. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to just take another job. I got to just make it happen. I got to just do these things. A lot of times you did not ask to be put in these situations, but, but we are. And it's usually out of necessity or survival. Look at verse 4. Am I on verse 4? No. Verse 4, it says, um, when she, I'm in Genesis 16. If I could get my papers together. Are y'all there with me? Y'all not taking my word for it, right? All right. So she, she had the burden of not having a voice. A lot of us black women feel the same way. Not always having a voice. She was feeling some type of way, and she wasn't allowed to express herself. She didn't have a choice. She didn't have a a, a say in the matter. And we kind of feel a lot of time when we begin to complain or get frustrated, once again, we are that angry. What's her deal? What, what's, why, why are you getting so loud? You know, what's going on with you? Not having a voice. 
But I want to look at an a observation. Sarah, uh, Hagar runs away. She's like, I can't take it no more. I'm, I'm leaving. An angel meets her in the field. And the angel of the Lord, uh, he said to Sarah, the angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael. For the Lord has what? Seeing the pattern here. Seeing the pattern here. So God doesn't just care about the big things in your life. He heard her misery. He heard it. Women, you need to know God hears you on today. You are not invisible. And verse 13 is the most beautiful verse. Whenever I'm going through something, I love this verse. She, and it says, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. She called God, you are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me, our Sawabona series. God is the one who sees you. She named that God. She said, I don't know who you are. I don't know what kind of God this is. But all I know is that he's the God who sees me. Women, look at your life. I know you've been through heartache. I know you've been through struggle. You need to know God sees you. He's the God who sees. And a lot of time the enemy wants to tell you, like, God don't care. Girl, you got to just do what you got to do. You just make things happen. He sees you. If you don't leave with anything else, know that God sees you. All right? He, she was not invisible. Now, I have a challenge to our congregation. We're, we're almost done. You guys go and watch football and get some chili or something and get back under the covers on this rainy day. I have a challenge to our congregation in light of the two black women that we've just seen. Uh, and it's in Galatians um, 6 and 2, if you could turn there. This is a challenge to our congregation as we enter this series. Galatians 6 and 2 says, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. This is our challenge as a congregation. This is our challenge, people, on Facebook. As a congregation, if you are not a black woman, we are asking that you will stand in solidarity with us. All right? If you're not a black woman, please stand in solidarity with us. The Bible commands us to bear one another's burdens. We just went over a series of burdens that we sit with every day. And we hope that you will walk in our shoes and carry these burdens with us. It says, Bear one another. I mean, you get up under these burdens with us. And then when you do that, you fulfill the law of Christ. We all want to do God's will. This is God's will, to bear one another burdens. For every time you think you're something, God says you're deceiving yourself. When you think you're too high, you think you're too inferior, you think that's below you, you're deceiving yourself. Please stand with us. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ. What? Well, I don't want that one. Don't read that yet. Yeah, there it is. Um, Galatians 3.28. Anybody got that? Galatians 3.28. I'm going to do Baptist style because I forgot to add it on my slides. Galatians 3.28. Can somebody get that and stand and read it? Read it loud. Read. You remember they'd be that? Only Deke know what I'm talking about. Galatians 3.20. Come on. Read. Real loud. So there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. All right. Did y'all hear that? There's neither Jew nor Gentile, male or female, slave or free, for we are all one in Christ. Now, you know, when, Jews, when, when, when Jesus came and said there's no more Jew and Gentile, that was huge. 
That was a huge barrier. Jews didn't do no fooling with the Gentiles at all. So when God came and like, no, no, there's no more of that. We're all one. There's no more men or women. Women were not even considered a citizen, not even, they were just a piece of property. You don't get no rights. You don't get no say. Go sit down somewhere, right? Slave nor free. Slaves had no rights, as we know. God erased that all and said that we are one in Christ. So this is my challenge to the church. Everybody listen. Hang in there with me. Let this church be a safe place, right? Where you say, you know what? You might experience microaggressions all week and racism everywhere else. But when you come here, you're going to experience love. I will see you as God sees you. This is, our, this is our, my challenge to our congregation. When we walk in here, and now this is not colorblindness. Can we get that straight? We're not being colorblind. You know, I just don't see any color. Well, no, you should see color. You know, I see your difference, and I appreciate it, and I celebrate it. That's what we want here. You're not invisible. We are, we, we are all one in Christ, right? Also, if you're, not, if you're non, not a black woman, can you please use your privilege to bring awareness in your circles? So where you live, where you reside, where you work, if you hear somebody talking a little, you know, or saying things that aren't correct, or things that you know that are not true, will you speak up? Will you be a brother and sister in Christ? Will you be an ally to us? Will you correct people when they're kind of going off on the wrong path or, you know, being racist or, you know, lumping us into stereotypes? We're depending on you to be the voice to reach people that we'll, we may not ever have influence to reach. All right? Will you guys agree with that with this? And then also we're asking that you would just lean in with us. Lean in. The, we are truly brothers and sisters in Christ. We're bearing one another's burden. Come to these live groups. Lean in with us. Show your solidarity with us. Let this not be the series. Be like, well, I'll check back when y'all doing the series on love. When y'all doing when y'all when y'all doing some on dating, I'll be back. Like this is when we need y'all. We need to see your love and your support. Now, I also have a challenge to our black men. If you're a black man, raise your hand. Ooh. Oh, I just want to do like a team or something. All right. Black men, if you are in here, it's going to take men who love God to stand up and say no more. It's going to take y'all. Men who love God, men who are reading this Bible, Men who are in this space, it's going to take y'all to stand up and be like, okay, enough is enough. I hear everything that's on the radio. I hear everything what y'all saying while we playing basketball. I know everything when we go out, but enough is enough. Too long, far too long, it has been our very own brothers who sexualize us, exploit us, prey on us, treat us as sport. How many you got, bro? I don't know how many you got. Right? Lied, we've been lied to, cheated on. You know, black women hold a lot for, for black men. We love hard. And we will defend y'all to the end of the earth. But a lot of times we don't get that in return. We don't get that in return. So men... It's time to start building a culture of loving, esteeming, and appreciating our black women. It's going to have to start with you. We are challenging you. If it, if it don't start at home, where else can we, where else, who else going to love us? Y'all, we have to lead the way. So, men, I'm asking you, if you're in this congregation, if you're a part of us, if you're a visitor, start a new culture. Start speaking well of our women. I think there's a sign somewhere in West Oakland that says, you know, black women, we love you. you no, know, black women, you're beautiful. We don't hear that nowhere else. We don't see it on TV. We don't see it on magazines. 
We don't see it on TV shows, movies. We're, we're never, you know, lifted up as the epitome of anything. So black men, can y'all start a new culture when you're in your jobs and you're at your cubicles, when you're talking with your homeboys, when you're with your fellas, you hear somebody talk a little something, hey, bro, no, uh, we're going to love these women. No, 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 no. And you know, if you got some, you know, you got some a woman who really loves you and has her heart for you, you know, don't treat her as sport. Don't, don't just, don't just mess over her. Let's end that culture. You know, we, we, we're not even among our men sometimes esteemed as the ultimate thing of beauty or a trophy or whatever. We're kind of like, oh, I guess I'll get it. You know, I guess I deal with a black girl. We want to change this culture. Y'all with me, black men? <laughs> Lastly, my last encouragement is to black women. Our book is a series about a yoke that is too heavy that we've been carrying for too long. But I have good news for you. It's in Matthews 11, 28 and 29. Where Jesus said, come to me. He said, come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. This is Jesus talking. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Come on, Jesus. He said, come to me. You know, we've been, you, we've been taking on yokes, taking on burdens, taking on this, taking on that. Here we have a Savior who says, take my yoke. See, this is the difference. You know, if you ever see the yoke, we're not talking about egg yolks for anyone you, new to church. We're talking about what they used to plow in the field with oxen or donkeys or any kind of things or horses. They would put a yoke on them. There's one on this side, one on the other side. The key to doing a, a, putting a successful plowing is that the, the yoke has to be even. You can't have like a little baby pony and a big bull or something at the same time because, you, you know, your plow is just going in circles, right? So the good thing about Jesus, you got to get this. He didn't just say, here, let me just give you a more a easier yoke. Here you go. I'm just going to put a little less on you. That's not what he's saying. He's like, hey. Come to me. Hey, I'm going to put this yoke on with you. I'm going to get up under this with you, women. I'm not just going to give you something. Hey, let me shoulder this with you. You put yours on. You put mine on. All right, you ready? Let's go together. And my yoke is going to be easy, and it's going to be light. So we've been putting on heavy yokes, holding everything for everybody. Jesus is like, hey, partner up with me. Come to me. You've been trying to get it from everybody. I've been trying to get validation from here, trying to get validation from there, trying to get this person to love you, trying to take care of this, trying to take care of him, trying to take care of them. Jesus is like, hey, come to me. I'll, I'll, I'll burden that yoke with you. Come on, let's put it on together. Let's do this together. Will you do life with Jesus? Will you let him take that yoke? Will you join, yoke, join up with him? Women, give it to Jesus. See, the whole premise of the book is that we've been doing it, and it's been killing us, literally. But now we're going to give it to Jesus, and we're going to find rest for our soul. How many would love that? How many would love to partner up with Jesus and watch him lighten that load? He's lighting it because he's taking it on. All right. Women, you are not invisible. To everyone in here, we've talked to our non-black brothers and sisters, to our men, to our women. Now, to everyone in here, if you have a black woman in your life and it looks like she's holding a lot, don't just stand back and admire her. Who you, you, girl, how you do it all? You are amazing. You just cooked, you just cleaned, you do it. You went and ran over here, you, girl, you are strong. You is strong. You is smart. <laughs> just sitting back and just admiring. Girl, you better take that, hold that yoke, girl. 
you all right. That girl all right. She's strong. But instead of just standing back and admiring her, help her out. Be a blessing. Be a blessing. Be a blessing. Then that just means you just simply talk to people. How you doing? You doing good? You need any help with anything? You guys see you holding a lot. Can I, can I take something off your plate? Can I be there? Can I just give you some prayer? You, you good? You doing all right to, today? Be a blessing. You are not invisible. You are not invisible. I just want you to put that in your spirit. God sees and God hears. Even the minutest details of your life, God sees it.